assalamu alaikum students so we continue with our circulation lectures and today we will discuss uh, blood pressure control uh, both uh, acute uh, look at it all of the acute mechanisms i.e. short term quick mechanisms and long term mechanisms so basically there are two broad learning objectives today one is the importance of blood pressure control uh, and the second are the actual mechanisms which uh, form a timeline uh, of how they address any change in blood pressure. So, uh, what's the whole, uh, the whole concept about? Uh, we mentioned this in the, in the initial part, uh, the first few lectures of circulation that uh, amongst the main three, four tenants of circulatory control, uh, cir circulation overall, one of those pillars uh, is actually blood pressure control. Uh, we we look at we, we look at the importance of things uh, by how much investment we do for a particular concept or or, or, or mechanism. So today you will you will notice that uh, to control the blood pressure within a certain range. Uh, the body implies several mechanisms spanning over a, a very broad and impressive timeline uh, to keep this blood pressure in control. So why is it that blood pressure is so much important? Well, the one line answer is because it determines, uh, it's one of the main determinants of tissue perfusion. That the whole point of circulation is to supply blood to organs. And if you don't have adequate perfusion pressure, uh, you can't do that. Okay, so let me start with an example uh, uh, to justify this line that cardiovascular system needs to maintain just mean arterial pressure and that tissues just tap into it. Uh, think of uh, an over overhead uh, water reservoir as you see in residential colonies all over uh, your cities. These big uh, sort of monuments of cities which you can see from afar. Uh, these are big water collection reservoirs which are intentionally made at a significant uh, height. Okay, uh, so they are, they are, uh, they are uh, way above uh, the average uh, height of houses, uh, flats and other residential schemes. So what's the point here? Why are they high and what's the whole architecture? So, water is collected uh, by virtue of pumps. Uh, we call them donkey pumps. Uh, water is collected in these reservoirs, okay? And then it stays there. All, all uh, th these tanks are then connected to their respective residential societies. And so, for example, if you are a person living on the ground floor of a house, uh, all your taps, all your... Uh, water su supply is connected to this eventually is connected to this uh, overhead huge water tank or water reservoir okay uh, all you need to do is open a tap okay because the pressure is so much because you have created a delta p a huge delta p by raising the water column way above the level of your house so when you uh, you open up any tap of water you let that whole column of uh, water to, to allow to come out of that tap and hence you have flowing water it's a very simple concept so all you need to do is maintain the water presence in that in this tank and you will have running water it's when you run out of the tank water is when you get problems with your water supply right so it just just put this uh, very simple uh, example to the cardiovascular system that the heart and circulation together i.e cardiac output and total peripheral resistance okay you need to be comfortable with these two terms now they should ensure that the arterial side of circulation has adequate pressure so that whenever uh, an organ uh, needs to uh, uh, increase its uh, its uh, share of blood 
it can it can quote unquote just open up a tab okay uh, while addressing situation addressing condition uh, it is ensured that every organ will get their basal level blood supply anyway and in case as i said if if, if this uh, uh, requirement is to increase all they need to do is vasodilate their vessel i.e. quote unquote open the tap and there will be increased blood okay so that's 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 why cardiovascular system rather than uh, going into every organ and trying to regulate it heavily uh, it's it's uh, really the organs are autonomous in their own blood supplies the cardiovascular system invests a lot in maintaining the central blood pressure if i may use this term which is called the arterial blood pressure just to ensure that the water tank is always filled up with water proverbial speaking proverbially speaking okay so <clears throat> there are two main factors main two main divisions of this regulation one is nervous uh, in which we will we we'll study the various uh, uh, central nervous system mediated responses to uh, blood pressure regulation and the other is uh, hormone and this is the timeline that i was mentioning uh, it's divided into there are seven regulatory mechanisms so there, there it is uh, and it's divided across uh, three dimensions acute intermediate and long term these are time dimensions so acute means immediate intermediate means uh, uh, somewhere in between and long term means months and uh, uh, hours to uh, weeks to months and so on um, so this is what i was saying uh, acute is seconds to minutes intermediate is after many minutes and long term is basically uh, weeks to years now you will see a, a list of uh, uh, mechanisms under each heading i just want you to just go through it and we'll be discussing each uh, in, in some detail acute number one the most famous is baroreceptor reflex number two is cns ischemic response then you have the chemoreceptor response intermediate you have again three and renin angiotensin vasoconstrictor uh, mechanism stress relaxation and fluid shift and in the long term you have renin angiotensin but it is replaced by aldosterone system so long term in long term you have basically an aldosterone system which addresses these things let me just uh, say a few words general words before we go into the nitty gritty of things uh, acute mechanisms should always be viewed as uh, uh, saving the day kind of mechanism. So, if they don't come into play within literally seconds, uh, the whole game uh, may be lost. So, if somebody comes in, uh, experiences what a bit a road traffic accident and and starts to bleed, uh, uh, the blood pressure will will obviously plummet. Uh, there is no point in uh, this person. Uh, uh, depending on his intermediate mechanisms or long-term mechanisms, if the acute mechanisms within seconds don't save the day for him, those few initial, few important, crucial hours uh, to save his life at, the, at that particular time so that afterwards these mechanisms can come and bring back the whole system back to normal. So during emergencies, during uh, uh, urgencies, uh, you will have your baroreceptor reflex working uh, in and out. Uh, uh, then you have the CNS ischemic response working as a last ditch response, as we will see. And chemoreceptor is a, a relatively minor concept in circulatory physiology. You have studied this in detail in respiratory physiology. Uh, so, so this is this is what I wanted to say about acute mechanisms as opposed to. Uh, later on mechanism especially the long term a few words about long term is usually uh, it relates to kidney as is as is the case here and kidney basically comes to the party late but the 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 feature of kidney is that it brings the whole uh, disturbance which got it involved in the first place back to normal thought Acute mechanisms are not known for their accuracy, uh, but kidney is, okay? Acute mechanisms are known for their speed, uh, and hence uh, the speed comes at some sort of a crudeness in, in, in terms of bringing the whole thing down to, uh, to naught. However, the long-term, i.e. kidney-mediated responses, 
although they are late to be triggered however uh, they 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 ha they are known for their accurate uh, uh, bringing the whole thing back uh, to normal whether it's blood pressure whether it's ph control whether it's uh, osmolarity everything that kidney does it does it slowly but it brings the whole thing back to mathematical equilibrium okay so the, i borrowed this uh, very excellent diagram of guyton from its uh, from his uh, second chapter on uh, mind you there are two chapters dealing with blood pressure control the first is acute and intermediate and the second one is long term so i picked this from the summary right at the end of the second chapter of blood pressure control and it gives you very nice timeline as you can see seconds minutes hours to days and and so on to infinity really and it plots all these uh, all these mechanisms uh, as a feedback gain uh, uh, statistic and 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 you can see how uh, all, all on the continuum uh, these uh, these seven uh, uh, play out and the the really the three if you can see you 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 are able to you'll be able to study this in detail when you open up your books but right now you can see that the three prominent ones i would say i would say is the black one the baroreceptor one look at how quickly it is literally the first thing that happens uh, after any acute change in pressure so the first thing that happens is baroreceptor reflex it goes and peaks then it flattens and then it within minutes to hours also drops back so within days you will lose your baroreceptor reflex as a as a uh, mechanism to against any blood pressure fluctuation if you don't uh, uh, address it within within those days so if the blood pressure change is uh, of a significantly worse nature uh, baroreceptor reflex will tirelessly work till days maybe 3 to 4 days uh, but then since they are basically acute in nature they will die down and come back and be of no use uh, after days uh, you see that cns ischemic response being the second uh, acute uh, most important acute mechanism uh, also comes in uh, uh, does its business uh, however it's much more uh, higher feedback loop again uh, but again sort of tapers off and uh, uh, fades away in the background so these are the two important ones then you have uh, lots of intermediate uh, low feedback gain uh, uh, mechanisms going on in the background then you get this red red line check this red line up this red line is basically kidney so the kidney response to to changes in blood pressure blood volume uh, is important so kidney basically what it does it it brings the whole thing back to normal to mathematical normal as i said and its gain is literally approaching infinity so you can throw any anything at blood pressure uh, eventually if the if it doesn't take the person's life eventually kidney will sort it out okay let's move on so we start with the acute mechanisms and as i said the first is valve receptor the second is seen as ischemic response and the minor one is chemoreceptor mechanism first up is valve receptor reflex so what are valve receptors as the name indicates valve receptors are basically pressure sensing receptors and uh, there are there are many uh, across circulation but two most famous uh, ones uh, are depicted here uh, at the bifurcation of the carotids okay right here uh, this uh, is the uh, carotid signs and then uh, tucked underneath are the uh, aortic uh, baroreceptors right here you will also notice that they are uh, uh, their neighbors the immediate neighbors are carotid and aortic chemoreceptors as well okay so baroreceptors and chemoreceptors basically they reside close by in the same site uh, uh, more found in uh, aorta and carotids but as i mentioned earlier they are also found elsewhere in the body however these are the ones which are which mediate the famous baroreceptor reflex okay as you can see this is a guyton diagram these these baroreceptors they basically have uh, uh, afferents uh, going up to the brain stem uh, where they where they integrate uh, 
with the CNS centers, and then you have e-friends coming down and doing their business. Okay, this is a uh, this is a much more detailed uh, diagram, uh, and here you will be introduced to when you read your books, you'll be introduced to uh, this this center. Now, where is this center? This center is in the brainstem. Brainstem is medulla plus pons. So remember, you know, if you have been to a, to a big nice hotel, you'll always find there's a, there's a section for businessmen, uh, and it's called a business center. And there you'll find all sorts of uh, uh, internet facilities, fax, photocopying. Uh, they used to have telex uh, back in the days. Now you have fax and all sorts of these things just to facilitate people who are doing business and have to communicate, uh, correspond uh, with their companies far away, this, that, the other. So that's the business center. So I usually use this word business center for brainstem because brainstem has your most important centers collected in one place. You, as you remember, in respiratory physiology, we studied that respiratory centers reside here. So today, you need to uh, uh, notice that the cardiovascular res uh, uh, regulatory nuclei, neurons, also reside here. And the main collection, uh, cascade of these neurons, is basically the vasomotor center. This is shown. This is the vasomotor center. And you can, as you can see, it has multiple uh, uh, nuclei in it. So it's a collection of neurons. And then within the collection, you have specialized neurons doing their own business okay and this resides in brainstem ideally located for it to mediate uh, uh, in inf incoming information from the periphery uh, take the dictation from cerebral cortex uh, but mainly uh, negotiating everything and maintaining everything unsubconsciously automatically because all of this stuff under the cerebral cortex all of this stuff is uh, unconscious you don't have any control over it uh, you have control over your cerebral cortex however so uh, just a, just a parting note on the cerebral cortex basically this is your conscious control so yes when you are scared or when you are relaxed that has a, has a has an effect on your pressure because cerebral cortex as you can see here has an effect on hypothalamus which is the master gland master area uh, area i beg your pardon uh, it's the it's the main area uh, which has lots and lots of functions as you'll be studying in your next year of MBBS. Uh, uh, so higher centers do have an input on hypothalamus. Hypothalamus also controls blood pressure via the vasomotor center, and hence any conscious uh, changes in mood, uh, uh, any emergencies perceived, any images which you you find either nice or disturbing, sounds all that sort of thing memories they have an effect on blood pressure via this input okay uh, but when you talk about the mundane the day-to-day -day, it's automatic and why is it automatic this is why it's automatic right so you know what efforts are these are uh, nerve uh, action potentials which are generated at the receptors and uh, uh, they travel back to the cns in this case, all those uh, uh, barrel receptors at the aortic uh, arch and the carotids uh, bifurcation, they generate those uh, very important signals about blood pressure, any fluctuation in that, and send it off to the brainstem, uh, vasomotor center, where in the vasomotor center, their port of first port of call is nucleus tractus solitarius, NTS. Basically, this you should note. Uh, integrates all the afferent information about blood pressure okay and then like a good postal service disseminates uh, this information uh, in three directions one is to send it off to higher uh, recording in progress weirdness when the BP goes down or uh, slight Tense, tense or uh, anxious when the BP goes up. Uh, then, very importantly, uh, look at this uh, input to the sympathetic uh, vasoconstrictor center uh, within the vasomotor center, 
short of it is VMC. Uh, then there is a vagal vasodilator uh, or cardio decelerator center. We will talk about this in a bit. So when NTS receives all the afferent information, it basically stimulates the vagal area and inhibits the sympathetic uh, area. This is an important point to note for first year medical students. This is one of those very common mistakes, uh, conceptual mistakes, silly mistake really, because it's very straightforward. You need to just remember that NTS, when stimulated by afferents, afferent information, it inhibits the sympathetic center and activates the vagal center. Okay, this bit you need to remember. Okay, and that within them there is obviously a negative uh, feedback loop. So when sympathetic gets turned on, as an example, it is it will basically snub the vagal center and vice versa. Okay, uh, this bit I'll, I I won't go into details here because we'll be discussing baroreceptor reflex in detail in the next slides. I will just complete this uh, whole discussion by saying that you now should remember, uh, should know that what is the effect of autonomic nervous system on the heart. So when, you, when, we, when we say that sympathetic stimulation is say uh, inhibited, uh, what will happen to the heart uh, when that happens? And if we say that vagal, uh, vagal or parasympathetic stimulation occurs, uh, increases, how will it affect the heart? You should be in a, 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 in a position to now comment on that, okay? Uh, well, very quickly, we'll say that parasympathetic stimulation basically slow, slows down the heart uh, while it does not have a very high uh, effect on its contract, contractility. Uh, sympathetic, on the other hand, has both effects. When it gets stimulated, it increases the heart rate and contractility, okay? So that's the heart done. Blood vessels, in blood vessels, Parasympathetic does not play a huge role, however, sympathetic does, okay? And it all depends on, as we've been discussing, it all depends on the receptor, whether it's alpha 1 or beta 1, okay? So that's that. Uh, for this slide, you have understood the uh, VMC, where it's located, uh, what does it constitute, uh, and very importantly, the circuit diagram of these three subnuclei. Now the baroreceptor reflex. So uh, basically, uh, imagine that blood pressure has gone down due to the, whatever reason. Blood pressure has gone down. Okay. Uh, and when I say blood pressure, I basically mean mean arterial pressure (MAP). Okay, that has gone down. So baroreceptor reflexes basically they are stretch reflexes. Okay. So at all times. In a, in a person who is alive, uh, he, he or she will have a blood pressure and hence there will be a constant force uh, on the walls of the, blood, of the blood vessels. So when you have a constant force acting on a vessel which contains a stretch receptor, you can imagine that that stretch receptor will be in a state of stretch at all times, right? Now what you've done is you have decreased that blood pressure. So the blood pressure has gone down, the degree of stretch of the wall has gone down, and so the receptor itself, the baroreceptor, has the degree of stretch on it has decreased. Okay, so when that has decreased, as as you can see here, uh, its firing rate, because look, it's a stretch receptor. The more you stretch it, the more activation you cause in it, and hence it becomes more active. It then throws out more volleys of action potential along its afferent uh, NTS receives more and uh, more uh, uh, supply of uh, incoming volleys of action potential and it increases its, its uh, uh, the three things that it it's supposed to do right if you remember the BMC diagram now in this scenario you have decreased firing rate of say the carotid sinus nerve okay so you can imagine that the NTS in this case will receive less a number of impulses and all, all over its, uh, the function of it, what normally it's doing, if you remember, what is it doing? Let me just go back, refer you back to the VMC. What is the NTS doing? Normally, it is keeping a check, uh, an inhibitory check on the sympathetics and it's, it's normally activating the parasympathetics. 
again as i mentioned earlier this is a this is a very crucial uh, circuit diagram that you need to remember so in case of uh, uh, decreased blood pressure uh, what we were discussing what happens is uh, when these impulses decrease in in their amount as in as is the case with uh, blood pressure going down decreasing blood pressure uh, the NTSS inhibition on the sympathetic subnucleus, sub uh, neurons, decreases. Okay. Uh, to understand it, uh, let me give you the opposite. If you uh, overactivate NTS, okay, uh, this inhibition will increase naturally because that's the nature of relationship. But if you make it weak, okay, this is a better way of saying it. If you make it weak, the sympathetic will come out of its inhibition okay the signals from nts if they weaken due to less activation from the afferents because the stretch has decreased and also and, and all that story that i told you this effect on sympathetic system dwindles it goes down and this effect on the way uh, the, the, the the vagus uh, it basically decreases so net result is sympathetic system will announce its liberty uh, freedom from the inhibitory uh, tyrannical effect of the nts uh, and it will activate itself it will affect the heart it will affect the blood vessels with what it's supposed to do increase the heart rate increase heart contractility vasoconstrict the vessels and at the same time uh, uh, the, the the parasympathetic uh, nuclei they were actually being supported by the NTS, but in this case, since NTS has now weakened, quote unquote, please don't write that. This is all conceptual. Uh, uh, since this has weakened, the vagus basically sort of switches off, and this sits in nicely with your activation of the sympathetic because these two don't see eye to eye, and if vagus goes down, uh, parasympathetic goes down, uh, this uh, basically liberates the heart from any slowing down okay and sympathetics can now properly drive the heart in the positive direction so coming back to the circuit diagram remember the flow chart rather remember this is a this is the main flow chart and if when you get a question uh, in your in your question examination we are expecting you to draw something like this to show your understanding clear understanding of how you uh, uh, how you understand this whole thing and it doesn't really matter if you get a generic question which does not give you a scenario in which uh, the, the, the uh, whoever is suffering from a fluctuation in blood pressure has uh, been shown to decrease his or her blood pressure or increase if you don't get that direction from your question it's really up to you whether you want to make this flow chart as a decrease in blood pressure flow chart or an increase in blood pressure flow chart both are equally valid so we, we were at the decrease firing rate of carotid sinus part here and this basically now you can understand that this will all of the afferents going into NTS will actually decrease. Okay, this has an effect on the parasympathetic side of things and the parasympathetic side of things. Let's get this uh, out of the way first. Parasympathetic activity of the heart decreases. This in itself it raises the heart rate since you know that it doesn't have any significant uh, contribution towards the contractility. Uh, parasympathetics really are concerned with heart rate. Increasing heart rate will tend to improve. Uh, the cardiac output and hence blood pressure okay. it's the sympathetic side which uh, which has the the juice here and by increasing activity of sympathetics to the heart and blood vessels you have all sorts of things increased heart rate increased contractility in the arterioles you have increased tpr with the to resistance because of constriction uh, important point to note here which often gets uh, uh, doesn't get enough attention uh, uh, from students is the constriction of veins we always talk about a constriction of arterioles but now uh, since it's a generic turn on of the sympathetic activity and sympathetics as i mentioned earlier uh, affect not just the arterioles but also the veins uh, so when you constrict a vein remember veins have a reservoir function and that that blood that they were holding up uh, for such an event basically now gets uh, into play and uh, when it gets constricted it basically gives out that reserved uh, stored volume uh, improves the venous return and when you know that venous return improves 
uh, with frank starting law you have increased cardiac output again all of this contributes towards increasing in arterial blood pressure pa here is arterial pressure arterial blood pressure so it's a classical reflex it started off with decrease of pressure and ended up with an increase of pressure through a plethora of activities okay this is your baroreceptor reflex now uh, guyton talks about very nicely about various features of baroreceptor reflex please remember throughout this discussion baroreceptor reflex is an acute mechanism it is not designed for long term it is acute and it has some triggers uh, some 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 uh, handles uh, through which uh, the body exploits it so the carotids basically are, are very sensitive around the 100 mmhg mark this is your normal uh, mean arterial pressure and uh, anything which fluctuates uh, uh, this mean arterial pressure the carotids really respond very spectacularly well uh, to any fluctuation uh, the maximum is 180 beyond which they they just fall off the grid and a very important to note is that uh, at lower pressures they are not very sensitive so around the, the 0 to 60 mark uh, they are not exquisitely stimulated uh, they are basically looking at around 100 mmhg so what if your uh, blood pressure goes below 100 hits below 60 what happens then well barrier receptor is not what happens uh, it's basically the second mechanism the cns ischemic response which we'll study after this okay so this is done uh, aortic barrier receptors is basically they they operate at 30 mmhg higher than carotids uh, so that's 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 that uh, this graph basically just tells you that the maximum number of impulses per change in pressure is around 100 something that we've done here so this is the sensitivity then you have the speed uh, very important to note is that if the change in pressure is pulsatile rather than constant then baroreceptors are most happy to oblige so if you have a situation where you have a have a constant increase in pressure one straight waveform a uh, baroreceptor won't respond however if you have a pulsatile pressure so delta p comes and goes comes and goes just like this just as in the aorta during systole it goes up the diastole it comes down then it goes up again then it comes down this is what we mean by pulsatile okay not one straight line on one straight graph going up only but pulsatile so when it's pulsatile they the the uh, the imp uh, impulses number of impulses coming out of say the carotids is very high okay so as you can see uh, when it goes up you have a change in traffic i'll comment on the differences here but just to give you a, 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 an overall concept first that when it's when it goes up the battery receptor responds by uh, its increasing in firing rate of uh, uh, of its battery receptors uh, and when it the pressure comes down it basically slows down the firing rate okay just remember that it's a stretch receptor if Uh, the pressure inside the vessel goes up during uh, cardiac systole naturally the valve will be stretched the battery receptor will be stretched when it's stretched it can becomes activated and the number of impulses that it can generate increases and when it's unstretched the opposite happens okay now what is this what is this he, they have they have plotted this whole thing against various mean arterial pressure so notice that at lower pressure say the lowest it's uh it's just registers one one graph point okay because as we mentioned below 60 it's uh, least stimulated okay uh, check out 100 so 100 and above it really responds quite impressively to any stretches any increases in pressure and goes nicely quiet during unstretching so it's this uh pressure around which it's uh, most happy and above 200 200 and more it's just goes berserk because uh it doesn't get time to uh relax um, and decrease its firing rate uh the pressure is so much that the activation that happens during the upstroke uh doesn't really die down during the diastole before the next upstroke comes okay anyway if you if you don't uh, uh, remember anything just remember that around 100 it's the response is most sensitive and pulsatile is the way to go as opposed to constant pressure 
Okay, so we say that uh, baroreceptor reflex is basically your bread and butter buff, uh, pressure buffering system. Uh, you borrow from it all the time, really. Literally, uh, every time you stand from a sitting position, uh, you employ your baroreceptor reflex. So very quickly, we'll be talking about this tomorrow uh, in scenarios, integrative integration scenarios of the cardiovascular system. But uh, just, uh, just a footnote here is when you stand, you basically go against gravity. So you are going against gravity by standing from a sitting position. As you, as you lunge forwards and upwards, uh, what happens is blood uh, tends to pool in the lower part of the body. Uh, and the blood pressure tends to drop at the baroreceptors, aortic and carotid ones. It's the, it's that second, literally second, uh, of the drop in blood pressure that is uh, picked up by the baroreceptors. So imagine your uh, when you're sitting, your mean arterial pressure is 100 mhg, and as you now go into a standing position, that 100 mg, 100 mmhg drop a few degrees. Uh, downwards, immediately it's picked up by the baroreceptor reflex, and the whole flow chart will should now come to your head. Uh, what will happen? And in literally in seconds, it improves the uh, blood pressure back to 100 due to that whole sympathetic uh, system activation. So maintenance of blood pressure in the in the daily routine activities is basically the function of this buffering system we call baroreceptors. Uh, this graph shows you that when you are, when you have a normal baroreceptor reflex uh, functioning, look at the fluctuations around 100. They are very nicely kept in the middle of these fluctuations. So you can go up or you can go down, but you will always find yourself coming back to the center of it. However, when you, in an experimental uh, uh, animal uh, preparation, when you denervated the baroreceptors, you cut off the nerve. Uh, and now you fluctuate the blood pressure, you see really wild stuff going all over the place uh, of this blood pressure. It's not regulated. Okay, now comes to the, uh, uh, to the last but probably one of the most important bits that I have been talking about. It is an acute mechanism. So uh, you really cannot depend on it in the long term. In fact, uh, it's kind of a, a, a let me say, a party pooper uh, in the long term, and it actually joins the quote unquote enemies in the long term. So, in that sense, it's funny. What I mean to say is, say, for example, you have a change in uh, mean arterial pressure from 100 to 130. Yeah, mean arterial pressure was 100, now it's 130. And it's just started now. Zero second, one second, two second, three, and so on and so forth. So, as we have studied, uh, it's an acute mechanism. As soon as the change has happened, will happen. It will uh, uh, go into overdrive. It will it will try to address this whole thing by the mechanisms that we've studied. Um, in this case, since we are discussing increased uh, mean arterial pressure as opposed to decrease, uh, what what should it do? In, in increase, there's too much traffic going up, uh, NTS becomes very busy, it really snubs the sympathetic nervous system, and hence the resultant is vasodilation. Uh, that should save the day and bring the blood pressure down. But let's assume that it doesn't, that the pathology, the whole disturbance that caused the increase in blood pressure in the first place, just stays on and on and on, okay, over, over, over hours to maybe days. Okay, now what happens then to the baroreceptor? It Recording in progress. Is that it keeps on switching, it keeps on trying to uh, uh, help the situation by uh, snubbing it down uh, by the whole reflex. But it, when it fails to do that over days, it actually resets, it then resets. To the new pressure so in this case it will reset around 130 that's what I meant by it's funny in the long term that it basically had his uh, had, had its head uh, focus at 100 uh, but since it failed it basically changed the goalpost and now 
starts to believe, quote unquote, that 130 is the new pressure, and it will just work around that. That's why hypertension is such a such a such a bad thing to have. Uh, in that, uh, you obviously have increased, sustained increased blood pressure over a long time, and that's why the diagnosis of hypertension is uh, arrived at. So, in that scenario, the baroreceptor reflex really have you have sort of switched them off basically uh, because the new pressures are are high and baroreceptor has absolutely no no give here no no say here. Okay, this is called accommodation. It's a, it's an important question. It can be asked in vivers. Can be asked in SQs as well. Uh, accommodation is when the receptor accommodates to uh, a newer pressure, uh, and this signifies the role that it plays in. Uh, short term, not long term. Okay, that's 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 done. That's by receptor. Coming to CNS ischemic response. Remember, we are talking about CNS ischemic. So alarm bells should go on uh, in your head. Uh, there is ischemia in the CNS. What's going on here? And we did mention that baroreceptor reflex do not work uh, below 60. Uh, they are exquisitely sensitive around 100. So what happens? Who is the hero below 60? Well, you're looking at it. Google Ads can help you find new customers, no matter how they search for your business. Say you own a copy. So basically, VMC, i.e. vasomotor center, is residing in the uh, CNS, as we mentioned. And any ischemia, you know what ischemia is. Cerebral is uh, related to uh, cerebrum, i.e. the brain itself. Ischemia is less blood supply. Anything which drops the blood pressure to such an extent that it decreases blood supply to the brain, specifically the VMC causes a strong excitation reaction from the VMC. Uh, sympathetics go haywire. Okay, they are super uh, stimulated, which causes a massive vasoconstriction all over the body. Okay, and the blood is diverted from all of the organs uh, to the brain. So imagine all the doors to the organs are either shut or nearly shut so that uh, the blood is diverted the, the entire volume is diverted to the brain because uh, if you can't save the brain in this situation then the whole thing is lost or the whole battle is lost so any cerebral ischemia is basically a very alarming situation in the body and the body literally shuts down uh, most of its circulation to save the brain by massively going into vasoconstriction. This is mediated by the sympathetic part of the vasomotor center that we are now, uh, we have now recognized. Uh, and it's an emergency control system and it kicks in only when the blood pressure falls below 60 mmHg uh, or even lower than that, okay? So this is that brain ischemia, which uh, basically gets triggered by a decrease in systemic arterial pressure. Please remember this. CNS ischemic response are of two types. One type I have explained to you that the, the decrease in blood pressure is because of a disturbance in the systemic circulation elsewhere. The second type is called Cushing's reaction. Okay. The only difference, the, the reaction is the same. The only difference is in this case, the disturbance comes from within the brain itself. So the ischemia, the cause of ischemia is different. Here, the cause of ischemia is outside of the brain. Here, it's within the brain. So any tumor or any other, uh, say hydrocephalus, any other situation which causes increased intracranial pressure will cause uh, uh, constriction of the uh, snubbing of the arteries, narrowing of the arteries of the cerebrum. And exa exactly the same thing would happen. Ischemia would happen, okay? And when ischemia would happen, again, uh, blood supply to the BMC will decrease and the same cascade of reactions will be done uh, to save the brain blood supply. The only difference here is that the instigation, the trigger happens to be the brain itself. Okay. This is an important viva question. Okay. Having done that, we go to the uh, relatively minor uh, chemoreceptor mechanisms. Remember the role of peripheral and central chemoreceptors. I uh, recorded detailed uh, videos, video lectures on the role of peripheral chemoreceptors and central chemoreceptors. Uh, here, their role is not very major. Uh, so their role in blood pressure control 
is this basically. Uh, if you remember very far chemoreceptors, they, they reside uh, again ne right next to their brothers, the baroreceptors uh, 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 under the uh, arch of aorta and under the bifurcation of carotids. Uh, and if you remember, the, the, their main stimulation is a drop in PO2. Uh, and if you really remember those lectures, you would remember that hypoxia or decreased uh, arterial uh, oxygen tension coupled with an increase uh, in carbon dioxide and uh, hydrogen ions really ramps up uh, the peripheral chemoreceptor response. Uh, uh, lone decreases in PO2 uh, are less potent than uh, decreases in PO2 coupled with increases in uh, carbon dioxide and uh, hydrogen ions. Anyhow, so uh, this is the main stimulus with or without the uh, carbon dioxide hydrogen business. Uh, when the arterial PO2 goes down, it stimulates uh, the, the, these peripheral chemoreceptors located here, uh, which now you will study. This is new information for you. Uh, over there, you studied in respiration, you studied that when hypoxia happens, it basically gets, they get stimulated, the peripheral chemoreceptors, and then they uh, trigger the, the DRG, the respiratory uh, centers in the brainstem, and all sorts of increased ventilatory efforts then uh, starts to be triggered. But here we are obviously discussing uh, circulation. So the same stimulus, besides turning on the ventilation, now you study that it also has an effect on the sympathetic vasoconstrictor center of the uh, VMC, and it causes vasoconstriction on in the major organs, uh, so that the blood is uh, made available uh, in the arteries. It stays in the arteries uh, so that it goes up. Uh, the artery blood pressure goes up. So basically, what is happening is uh, in this uh, mechanism, a decrease in, or let's say, a change in PO2 is translated into circulation language okay so a decrease in po2 is uh, read as a decrease in blood pressure okay and hence sympathetics are turned on and vasoconstriction takes place okay there's a footnote here that it, this also causes a transient heart rate decrease in heart rate uh, by activating of uh, uh, parasympathetics but this is a transient thing and it uh, sort of uh, fades away uh, quickly. Uh, then you come to the central chemoreceptor, you know the location, It's uh, they are part uh, and parcel of the medulla again, medulla comes in again in the discussion, uh, they are part of the brain and uh, in pushing reaction type situation or anything which uh, basically uh, leads to CNS ischemia, cerebral ischemia, uh, what, what would happen in that uh, is uh, carbon dioxide will start to immediately go up, hydrogen ions will start to go up and uh, uh, what happens is central chemoreceptors, as you remember, they have not much to do with oxygen. However, they are very, very uh, respondent to the hydrogen ion concentration and the carbon dioxide. So in this case, when you have ischemia, all sorts of stimulatory signals are now going to activate the, the central chemoreceptors, which detect these changes and directly increase, again, the sympathetic outflow, which again causes a constriction, and the blood is diverted to the brain. And Cushing's reaction, uh, the, the same thing happens. It's just that the the, the space of uh, the cause of ischemia is the brain itself. Uh, again, finishing this off by saying that this is a minor component. However, it's an in, in, it's an important tail, quote unquote, of the whole acute mechanism. We all have a someday list, but someday can start today. Finish your bachelor's degree online with no application fee. We then hop over to the intermediate mechanisms. Intermediate mechanisms are less tricky, so good news for you. And uh, uh, basically, guidance, I guess, mentions these three. Uh, these uh, uh, are there as well. They are, they are the hormonal component to this uh, whole uh, story. Uh, but these three are basically what the examiner will be looking at uh, when uh, you get a, a question on the intermediate mechanisms. One is fluid shift second is stress relaxation, and then uh, basically a renin-based uh, vasoconstrictor mechanism. Uh, so quickly, we, we talk about fluid shift. So imagine if you have an increase in blood pressure and it, it has not been, very importantly, it has not been addressed by the acute mechanisms. 
So it has stayed over on that timeline. Now the intermediate mechanisms come into play, okay? And one of those is, is fluid shift. So at the capillary level, uh, simply put, the fluid will come out of the capillary, bringing down the volume inside the, inside the blood vessels, and that will decrease the blood pressure. This is as simple as that. Uh, stress relaxation, again, is a very simple mechanism. Uh, and again, let me mark my words here. You, you have a sustained blood pressure disturbance which has not been addressed by uh, the acute mechanisms and uh, it has now come to the intermediate mechanisms. So the number two thing to study is stress relaxation. It's literally, as the name says, the vessels will dilate in response to a sustained increase in blood pressure and when they dilate, they, the blood pressure comes down. Remember, fluid shift and stress relaxation are equally uh, applicable on the vice versa situations i.e a decrease in blood pressure will cause fluid shift from the interstitium into the vessels and stress relaxation will will basically decrease uh, causing vasoconstriction if there the blood pressure has gone down coming to renin angiotensin vasoconstrictor mechanism this is a this is a main mechanism and let me just uh, tell you here that it has two components one is you're seeing it, the vasoconstrictor element of it. There is another aspect, the aldosterone uh, aspect. That then will take you into the long term. So be very, very clear about this system. Renin, angiotensin, vasoconstrictor mechanism, and renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism. The aldosterone one is the long term. Uh, a way to remember it is again uh, manipulating the diameter of vessels is a quick fix method. So vasoconstrictor mechanism is a quick fix. So it will, in a timeline, it will come in earlier than long term. However, uh, anything which has to do with A, kidney, B, blood volume itself, not the diameter of vessel, this will take time. Hormones take time. Remember, whichever bit you remember uh, better. Hormones take time to work. Aldosterone is a hormone. It will take time for it to be released from the adrenal gland. It will take time for it to rise up in the blood gradually. And then eventually it will start acting on the kidney to cause blood volume changes. Okay. This is all a long, long scenario. Not very long, but it, ta it, it takes days to set it. Okay. Uh, let me see if... Uh, so, as you can see, this is what we are talking about. Aldosterone uh, basically starts to uh, get secreted in hours. However, uh, its, its, uh, its effect takes place when it rises up. The gain that you, it, it gives you rises up and through days it then improves the situation. It's really coming in late, but it basically adds to the overall renal response of the blood pressure mechanism to infinity okay uh, vasoconstrictor mechanism is given in green this is it this is that vasoconstrictor mechanism you can see that vasoconstriction can only go so far uh, because it's as i said it's a stopgap arrangement uh, working with uh, diameters of vessels you can only get so much however when you start to look at the actual disturbance of the blood pressure the fundamental issue of the blood pressure is basically the blood volume. So when you start to deal with the blood volume of things, the gain is infinite because now you actually are handling the situation from its root. Okay. Going back quickly to the slide we were at, we were, we were here. Here. Okay. So. When we talk about the vasoconstrictor uh, component of the renin angiotensin system, basically it comes in the intermediate uh, sort of things because before this, the mighty baroreceptor is doing its business. But when that doesn't come to work and that uh, the, flat, uh, the curve is flattened of the baroreceptor reflex, you have renin angiotensin trying to save the day. Uh, and we talk about this in in a in a flow chart way in the in the coming slide. So let me just say this that this mechanisms, this component comes under the intermediate mechanisms. 
Then you have vasoconstrictors and vasodilators. We have discussed this role of epinephrine. The, the receptors uh, in, uh, have a, a good read of this uh, from your textbooks. So this is intermediate mechanisms uh, controlling blood pressure. Now the long term. Long term is really uh, uh, three, three things. Uh, more of this is one thing. Uh, main thing is the aldosterone bit. But let me just get it, let me get this out of the way because it, that mentions it at the, the onset of the uh, second chapter. It mentions uh, pressure diuresis, sedentary vessels, and diuresis. So this, these are crude mechanisms. Uh, you have a barbecue meal, okay? Um, you get thirsty. So what is happening is barbecue meal. Why is the bar barbecue is high on salt and all those masalas uh, that you have in it, uh, which makes it uh, tasty. Uh, but at the same time, then it triggers a thirst response by which, by virtue of which, you increase fluid intake as well. So basically, you're flooding the, the cardiovascular system with a with a lot of fluid, both salt and water. Uh, the kidney will simply uh, increase the salt output which is referred to as natriuresis and increase the water output which is referred to as diuresis in the ensuing minutes to hours so that uh, the atrocity that you caused by having this meal and its attendant fluid is is uh, uh, worked out sorted out and extra salt is thrown out extra water is thrown out and that's it this is basically these two terms uh, really simplified Guyton does go into details, graphical details, uh, uh, by graphical I don't mean those graphical details, graph based details uh, and basically uh, mentioning the, the same basic concept that I described. With this out of the way, look at this. This is the main renin angiotensin aldosterone system. In the intermediate mechanisms we studied renin angiotensin is a constrictor mechanism that is intermediate. This now, by virtue of a hormone, is long term. So what's happening? What's happening is you again start the proceeding with a decreased uh, arterial blood pressure scenario. Okay, but in this case, we are looking at how the kidney gets affected by this whole thing. As I mentioned to you, the cardiovascular system, uh, the mainstay of the cardiovascular system, is to maintain mean arterial pressure. You didn't do that here. So it got decreased. When it got decreased, since mean arterial pressure ensures tissue perfusion, and if you decreased it, tissue perfusion will drop. Renal tissue perfusion is no exception. Okay. So in this case, as soon as the mean arterial pressure dropped, you have a decrease in renal perfusion pressure, which then, uh, and this is second year stuff really, so just just remember this: uh, decreased renal pressure, uh, perfusion pressure leads to release of a hormone called renin. You probably have studied it in, in your A-levels and your FSC uh, that renin gets released by the kidney. Let's, let's keep it at that. And renin being a hormone basically needs a substrate. So angiotensinogen is a plasma protein. Again, remember this please. This is one of the, I, it's crazy that such a simple information can be uh, turned into a mistake. It's not angiotensin, it's angiotensinogen. This is the substrate on which renin acts, makes it angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 itself is not very active. Angiotensin 1 gets converted into angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, ACE. Remember the, the hypertension theme on the Facebook that I've been running throughout these lectures. And in that, uh, the patient's name is what? Sake, is it? Uh, uh, he was then, uh, I remember the doctor's name, Dr. Aurakzai. Uh, uh, he eventually prescribes him a ACE inhibitor. Okay, this this is that ACE. So if you give the person an ACE inhibitor, you're blocking this enzyme, and you're blocking the formation of angiotensin two. So today, when you study the four main things that angiotensin two does, you understand why you would want to give an ACE inhibitor inhibiting formation of angiotensin 2 in a hypertensive individual very important point to note and correlate with hypertension which by the way will be discussed tomorrow in detail okay so settle up 
angiotensin 2 basically is a vasoconstrictor as the name indicates angio is uh, is vessel tensin is uh, uh, tension okay so angiotensin 2 is a very powerful vasoconstrictor and when it gets released it constricts arterioles increasing tpr and in itself that is quite uh, a major chunk of uh, blood pressure coming back to normal uh, it also triggers thirst which uh, uh, which then uh, gets you to drink fluids which adds volume again the pressure will come, will respond the volume and pressure are uh, connected you increase the intravascular volume you increase pressure okay. angiotensin 2 then uh, this is a, an exchange mechanism you should be able to understand exchange uh, let's say syncort mechanism okay so in kidney in the adrenal nephron there's a place called proximal convoluted tubule uh, there are uh, uh, sodium hydrogen exchange mechanisms i.e receptors uh, uh, in that section of the nephron uh, and what happens is uh, i beg your pardon uh, this is an antiport mechanism please correct antiport mechanism so for every uh, sodium that it absorbs it would secrete a hydrogen so it, it exchanges for each sodium that comes in the lumen of the tubule for a hydrogen that is formed within the tubular cell <clears throat> so angiotensin 2 basically increases this exchange which basically means increased sodium reabsorption and we know that sodium is related to volume uh, uh, so more, the more salt you retain the, the more volume it will give you and then it eventually goes to increase your blood pressure and this then comes to aldosterone Okay, so angiotensin 2 actually activates aldosterone so besides doing all of this which by the way in this flow chart is very very well well written here it's given uh, it's it's given uh, it's it, it's a very nice visual uh, view of it uh, summarizes it it's easy to remember this is from brs very very good book to, uh, to read summaries of things uh, so angiotensin 2 basically increases aldosterone uh, and aldosterone is known for it's sodium reabsorption by the tubule, the renal tubule, uh, not the PCT, not the proximal corner tubule, but in case of aldosterone, it acts on the distal convoluted tubule to increase sodium reabsorption by the DCT. And then again, as whenever you study, whenever you look at sodium, you should think about volume. Increase sodium reabsorption will enhance the ECF volume, and that will then bring the, the, the pressure back to normal. This is the renin angiotensin 2 aldosterone system, which is the mainstay of the long term mechanisms uh, which bring the blood pressure or keep the blood pressure to within normal range. Okay, so we have today discussed the timeline, the continuum uh, from acute to long term mechanisms of how cardiovascular system basically keeps the arterial blood pressure within normal range. Uh, tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be looking at uh, when things go wrong uh, uh, in hypertension. Uh, we will discuss what hypertension is after we have discussed some uh, very important integrative cardiovascular scenarios such as change in posture, hemorrhage, uh, and so on.